Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Muriel and in this video I will be doing my June reading wrap-up. In the month of June I read a rather modest, for me, <laughs> total of five books. Two books of non-fiction and three novels. I will start with the non-fiction with these two. The Greek and Roman myths, written by Philip Matisak, and the Egyptian myths, written by Gary J. Shaw. And as you may have guessed, these two books are in fact part of a series of titles dedicated to different mythologies, because I am a mythology nerd and this shit is basically comfort food to me, you know, storytelling, literary, creative comfort food to me. I don't have all that much to say about either of these, subject matter wise, given they provide you with exactly what you'd expect. Information about the mythology and culture stated on the cover, which you either will or won't be interested in, quite simply. So what I'll do now is quickly go over each book's key positives and negatives as someone who is already decently but non-academically knowledgeable about this stuff, and as someone who generally wants to learn new things when delving into yet another <laughs> publication about mythology. So first we have the Greek and Roman myths. On the plus side, this specific publication has an easy-to-follow structure and a deities-centric presentation of the material, which I enjoyed. The author makes a point of showing the ways in which this mythological canon is still part of contemporary Western, or more specifically Western European culture, through art or language, things like that. And he also presents several heroic quest stories, including Atalanta's female one, that was a plus, using the same basic analytical template, if you will, which as a result makes it easier to compare and contrast them to one another. On the minor side, there is a lot more here about ancient Greek mythology than there is about its ancient Roman counterpart. The influences or imports from Etruscan culture and religion on the latter also went largely unacknowledged, based on what I know of the topic at any rate. And whilst I appreciated the deities-centric presentation overall, I also think more could have been said about a few non-Olympian gods and goddesses. Hecate chief among them, but then again, I'm very biased there, so make of that what you will. Finally, I also think more could have been said about ancient Greek and ancient Roman theology specifically, and its evolution through time and the evolution of their respective mythologies through time. I wanted a bit of divine etiology basically. As to this publication about Egyptian mythology, on the plus side, it also has an easy-to-follow tripartite, for its part, structure based on domains of influence or realms of existence, if you will, these being the cosmos and birthplace of the gods, the material world where pharaohs ruled, both, you know, divine and mortal, and the afterlife of the duat. It features a lot of information about major and minor deities both, and delves into several different cosmogonical accounts, one of which I'd never even heard of before, so major point there for that alone. The author additionally presents a very detailed <laughs> account of what a deceased ancient Egyptian soul would have been expected to encounter during their journey through the Duat to their final resting place. On the minor side, the sheer amount of information provided by this reference felt a bit dense to absorb at times, and I think the book could have benefited from another couple of parts to spread its information out more. The way the author discussed the gods and goddesses of the Egyptian pantheons plural could have also been a tad more focused. And just as with the Greek or Roman ones, I would have appreciated etiological data for some of them, because I like to know about this stuff. Finally, whilst I was very glad to learn new things about ancient Egyptian theology, this information felt muddled and a bit confusing at times as well, given it was as densely presented as everything else in the book. So I love the information, it's just its delivery that, you know, could have been a bit smoother, I guess. Still, 
I think both of these serve as very good references overall, and I would definitely recommend them if you're a budding or more advanced mythology nerd. I rated both of these with a 7.5 out of 10. And additionally, I have three more titles in this series to go through, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Now onto the fiction. The first novel I read in June was John Scalzi's The Kaiju Preservation Society, and I had so much freaking fun with this one. This shorter novel is exactly what I more or less expected it to be. Self-aware entertainment for SFF nerds. Just like it says on the tin, this story features an NGO tasked with the study and ecological preservation of kaiju. So think Godzilla and friends, and centers on a cast of nerdy protagonists, with or without STEM degrees. The plot isn't revolutionary in the slightest. The Theming isn't there to turn any heads either, and that is clearly not the point. Though you know what? The self-aware cliché, humans were actually the real monsters all along, <laughs> still felt on point. Sue me. So I'll allow it. The characters are simply what the story needed them to be, right? And the world building, well, I mean, this book isn't trying to convince the reader it's ginormous beasties, and I mean ginormous <laughs> beasties are the most plausible things ever. Right? Even the scientists in the story are always going, yeah, sure, that makes sense, I guess, <laughs> about their titanic charges. But despite the fact I only very rarely read for sheer entertainment value, I loved this wild alt biology fueled ride, The Many Laughs. <laughs> It gave me and the multitude of cheeky SFF references it threw my way. In terms of honoring SFF nerd culture and featuring silly SFF humor, I was reminded of China Mieville's Kraken and Lev Grossman's The Magicians. However, if I have to pitch this book in terms of other works of fiction, I would more readily turn to cinema and argue the Kaiju Preservation Society felt like a cross between Pacific Rim or Godzilla or Cloverfield, I guess, though the meme aspects make me favor Michael Bay here, sue me. Tropic Thunder, yes, one of my favorite movie comedies of all time, and The Big Bang Theory. You'll make of that what you will, of course, as always, but I was very much here for it. Oh yes, and I am happy to say Island This Bish will be turned into either a movie or TV show at some point in the future. Assuming all goes well, of course, with all that stuff, but still, hell to the fuck yes. After that delightful fun time of a read, I reread March Piercy's Women on the Edge of Time. This is, as far as I understand it, a somewhat less well-known classic of feminist SFF literature from the 1970s that I first read in 2017 alongside Sherry S. Tepper's The Gate to Women's Country, which I also reread last April. And just as for Tepper's novel, there is now a review of Women on the Edge of Time on my channel, which you can check out if you so wish. All I'll say here is that just as I did with The Gate to Women's Country, and just as I didn't <laughs> With Wuthering Heights, I might add, I had a very positive rereading experience with this one. Marge PSE's novel features pretty thorough and certainly inspired utopian world building, theming centered on intersectional oppression and or feminist analysis, abuses of power within medicine, psychiatry specifically, and a flawed, but very credible main character whose skeptical point of view enhanced, in my opinion, the delivery and discussion of the novel's utopian ideas. I didn't relate to Connie Ramos, the main character, on a personality level, but certainly found her fully fleshed out as a protagonist. In fact, most of the character work felt satisfactory for a primarily ideas-driven story, though it did suffer from a slight lack of nuance where the antagonists were concerned. Nothing deal-breaking, however. I had more nits to pick about the utopian world-building specifically this time around as well, but still found a lot to think about and engage with on an emotional level. This is proper ideas-driven literature, and I love that. Though, I'll also concede, its feminist theming was less focused, or at least less focused on aspects of feminist theory I have the greatest interest in, than I found it to be in most other titles of the feminist SFF canon I've read so far. This means I lowered my original rating from, I'm pretty sure this is what it was, an 8 out of 10 to a 7.5 out of 10. 
but that's not bad by any stretch of the imagination in my rating system. Woman on the Edge of Time is a good to very good novel and absolutely deserves, once again in my opinion, its status as a classic of feminist SFF fiction. I would definitely recommend this one to any reader interested in that specific canon and or utopian fiction more generally. And then the third and final novel I read in June was William Gibson's Neuromancer, the first book in his Sprawl trilogy and a novel now considered a classic of science fiction literature for defining, not founding, the cyberpunk subgenre. It is both because of this classic status and because I have this year been properly introduced to the subgenre via a friend of mine who really loves the cyberpunk in literature, cinema, and games, that I decided to go ahead and read William Gibson's book. It is unfortunate that I read it over too long of a stretch of time, quite frankly, because my mental health and executive function took a serious nosedive in June, and maintaining focus or the will to keep reading was very difficult. Still, I'm pretty certain I would have found it just fine had <laughs> I read it under better external circumstances. I basically sort classics into two broad categories. Classics that serve as historical documents, if you will, and help us appreciate the evolution of this or that branch of literature, and classics that retain their artistry, their capacity to engage the reader's heart and or mind throughout time. Neuromancer, for me, is an example of the former category. This book was published in 1984 and it was innovative for its time. Genre-defining, yes, at least from a world-building point of view, but there wasn't all that much for me to chew on theming-wise, which I found a little weird. The characters were a bit whatever for me as with the plot, especially given I have watched a fair bit of um, Cyberpunk 2077 on stream, I also plan on playing it myself, given I've seen the Matrix trilogy, Ghost in the Shell now, the two Blade Runner movies, etc. There is a dedicated review for this one as well, if you'd like to hear me go into more detailed thoughts, so I'll leave it at that here. For me, this was an alright 5.5 out of 10 no more. It has its place in the history of SFF literature, I agree with that, and its world-building aesthetic vibes were reasonably engaging, but that's about it. I would thus only recommend this one if you're interested in exploring landmarks or time marks, as it were, of the genre, or rather subgenre in this case. Not on its own storytelling merits, if that makes sense. Last month, I watched yet another movie recommended to me by a dear friend, the second Alien movie, straightforwardly titled Aliens. Now, huge disclaimer here, I have never in fact seen the OG 1979 Alien movie, but I am, despite this weirdly knowledgeable about the Alienverse and its star critter, the Xenomorph because I went through an intense micro-special interest phase centered on them after seeing the movie Prometheus at the theater. I was like, this shit is cool! I want to know more! To the wikis! And Alien Covenant is the only movie I've ever seen at the theater by myself, true story. So good old Xenos and their predecessors. I know them, I know their parasitic life cycle, and I, well, okay, maybe not love them quite since she's beauty, she's great, but she'll also bleed acid on your face, so there is that. <laughs> Still very cool monster design and incarnation of the sheer horror fest that is parasitism. That zoology 101 module short traumatized me back in uni, let me tell you. <laughs> and so my friend, as it so happens, loves the alien verse, but he told me to go straight to the second alien movie, so I did. Besides, I mean, I do know the plot of the OG alien movie, because I went on the wikis and read about it. The second Alien movie does also feature Sigourney Weaver's character, Ripley, rescued from cold sleep 50 or so years after the events of the first Alien movie, and guess what? The people she works for, the Wayland yutani Corporation, have, in the intervening years, established a full-blown terraforming enterprise on the planet where her crew crash-landed in the first movie and, you know, gone massacred by the friendly neighborhood Xeno. And wouldn't you know once again, shit goes 
majorly south because of course it fucking does and Wayland Yutani comes crawling <laughs> to Ripley for advice on how to proceed. Now she has big PTSD. I mean if surviving Xenos doesn't give you PTSD nothing will quite frankly and decides hardcore exposure therapy is the way to go so she accepts the offered consultant job. Off she goes to the planet in question with a bunch of marines and shit ensues with lots of xenos, screaming, dying, you get the gist. And it was a good old time, yes Ripley is a badass female character in the positive sense of the word for one thing, and I enjoy the uh, grimy space exploration aesthetics of the 1980s alienverse for another. Then of course you have the xenomorphs. And the xenomorphs are horrifically awesome. That being said, I was more than a bit annoyed by the fact a fair bit of plot progression relies on human stupidity, which in all fairness is an issue in horror storytelling as a whole. I am aware of this, it doesn't mean I like it. Because <laughs> like the way the story ensures our main characters encounter Xenos in the first freaking place involves a fair bit of stupid. And stupid done by professionals no less and I was like oh come the fuck on, no way someone in that position would make that call. This is bullshit. I did have a couple of laughs however from the fact I called a character turning out evil from basically the moment he showed up on screen and from the fact I was essentially shouting at the characters to just get the fuck out and nuke the planet from orbit you done for for about 15 minutes before Ripley suggested the exact same thing and I went thank you. <laughs> the ending for its part was a tad over the top but it was also just a lot of fun and it felt very satisfying so you know what I'll allow it. And so yes overall I'm glad I watched this one. I don't know if I'll ever actually see the first OG alien movie. Only time will tell but either way Xenos for the win Am I right? On the video game front, last month I finished the main storyline of Hogwarts Legacy, which I happily streamed on Twitch as well. I've had a lot of fun sharing my gameplay with a few of you and will certainly continue to do so from time to time in the future. And there is a link for my Twitch channel on my YouTube channel, you can find very easily. As to the game itself, in my opinion it is the best part of us game we've ever had, bar none, and my childhood self is content. So point there. The game's story isn't the greatest thing ever, right? And yes, I have a few nitpicks with regards to some of the gameplay mechanics, but overall it's a very enjoyable and beautiful game that certainly pays delightful homage to its source material. I mean honestly the Hogwarts castle you get in the game is the best there is, period. Visually speaking, fight me on this one. Though, I'm sorry, but it's also true the game needs more magical creatures and more things to do with them specifically because that's just objective facts. You're not allowed to disagree with, just you're not. And it is a crime against <clears throat> nerdmanity that there is only one specimen of a certain magical bird to be found in the game. Me doth protest a lot. <laughs> and as a little extra I'm gonna throw in a mini book haul segment because why not and because I acquired a few physical books recently-ish that I'll only get to next year <laughs> but you know whatever. So I bought Nicola Griffith's Slow River it is, as you can see, published in the science fiction masterworks collection. You love to see it. I've had more positive than not experiences with Griffith's fiction. This one has been read by a friend of mine and she recommends it. And this one is also partially, I believe, technically speaking, classified as cyberpunk. So, you know, multiple birdstones, that general idea. Yay. And then there's the China Mieville back catalogue, quite simply, because I'm very sad he's no longer writing fiction as far as anyone knows. And yeah, uh, I just need that in my life, all right? So, well, I've got four of them. I got Looking for Jake and Other Stories. This is a short story collection and they're all in these specific Pan Macmillan editions. They got colourful spines, they'll all match up on my bookshelves. I love to see it, yay! So this one, 
there is King Rat, a novel originally... No, this one is meant for adults. There is Rail Sea, I think this one is meant for younger readers. And this one is certainly meant for younger readers. As far as I understand it, this is Un-London. And it actually features illustrations by Mievel as well, so yay bonus thingamajig. So yeah, look, they're all colourful and pretty and nice. And that concludes my monthly reading wrap-up for the month of June. As always, if you want to comment on any of the books I mentioned, feel free to do so, or on the Alien movie I watched, etc, etc. But on that very final note, I hope you all have a lovely day, evening, or whichever time of day you prefer. Do take good care of yourselves. Thank you for the continued support, and I shall see you all reasonably soon in another video, which will, yes, undoubtedly be a tier list video. Yay! <laughs> but until then, bye-bye.